What is the most life-altering revelation you've had in the last year? What is your most cancel-worthy hot take? <laughs> yeah, nice try, mate, you wish. Any travel romances? Motivation to stay the gym or sticking to a particular routine in general? Best advice for staying level-headed and how to avoid stress? Also, do you get lonely while traveling? Do you often hook up on your travels? Rumor has it you're a busy boy in Thailand. Do, how do you travel without working or are you working? Hello and welcome to the next adventure. Not your classic adventure because it's an adventure inside my mind today and inside yours. Uh, we're doing a Q&A, it's technically the 12k subscriber Q&A, but thanks to you, I'm now on 13,000 subscribers. So, welcome. If this is your first one, then enjoy. You're in for a wild ride. I've previously done a 9k, a 6k and a 2k Q&A, so you can check them out after if you think I'm worthy of your time. Otherwise, the way this works is, I asked for a load of questions on Instagram, obviously got submitted far more than uh, ever previously have. It's a bit bright when I put my glass on. And we're just going to do it in one smooth run. I'm going to get through as many questions as I can. Some of them will be stupid. Some of them will be philosophical and uh, pretty much everything in between. So if you ask a stupid one, thanks. And if you ask a deep one, then thanks as well. Hope I don't cry today on camera. <laughs> so let's get into it. Actually, no, let's not get into it because where am I? Looks pretty stunning, doesn't it? All of my previous Q&As have been in unreal locations. The last one was on Zanzibar on some crazy island overlooking beautiful turquoise water. The one before that was on a rogue island in Malaysia. And now we're in the Bahamas on Paradise Island where Casino Royale was filmed, if you know. I'm literally standing right in front of the Ocean Club now. Got some unreal content to come out here. I'm gonna push this video forward, but in the future, yeah, you've got some mad stuff to expect in this tropical paradise. Glad I could find such a perfect setting. Hopefully the camera won't overheat. That's probably priority number one. Priority number two is giving you some uh, entertaining chat today. Question number one, how do you stay motivated posting in YouTube even though you get less views? I admire that about you. Straight in the heart, no holding back. That is savage. Uh, but no, it's true. Like, it's been peaks and troughs. Obviously, this overall subscriber count uh, peaks, but I've just had my most viewed video, which was um, a skydiving one that's on like 90,000, and the El Mirador trek is on like 5,000 now. So, yeah, things grow. But the main answer to that question is when I started out doing YouTube, yes, it was to document things for myself and for my, me for my memories, but also I wanted to make the best possible videos. And so I make them for you guys to watch as well. Uh, so in the back of my mind, obviously the more people watch it, the more people enjoy it, but that's not really why I make the videos. But if you think like I'm getting a thousand views on every video, so a thousand, if a thousand people are sitting in front of an amphitheater, uh, watching and listening to what I've got to say, then that's not too shabby at all. And so, yeah, doing it for my own personal pleasure and focusing on the inputs rather than the outputs. And then the outputs always take care of themselves. If that's anything, if there's anything I've learned in my 26 years, it's, it's that, take that one home with you. Next question, rank your favorite continents. This guy wants me to uh, offend everyone all in one go. The only continent I've not been to is also the continent with zero people on it, which is Antarctica. So I'm gonna say Antarctica is my favorite. So I'm offending everyone all at the same time. Um, but no, I love every place that I've been to. Like I've got extremely fond memories. Obviously loads in Southeast Asia, which is if you're going for like a low budget backpacking location with loads of different culture, it's fantastic. Australasia was sick. I had some friends in Sydney and Melbourne, so haven't really explored that fully or New Zealand, but love Australasia, uh, Australia. And there's plenty more to do there. And I actually have some specific plans there. Obviously Central Asia still to attack, Sub-Saharan Africa, absolutely adored. And there's plenty more to do there as well. I'm just telling you, I like everything basically. Europe. Europe and Southeast Asia are pretty comparable in the sense that each country has its own like individual individuality and individual cultures but Europe's just far more expensive um, but obviously you've got Western Europe and Eastern Europe with Western Europe being far more explored and Eastern Europe a lot more untapped so um, I'm gonna go over there sit on the list as well all of North America so far is just the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico which is great very expensive uh, Central America is cool uh, I'll get talk a bit more about that because that's what we've just finished and then all of South America still to look forward to. The world's great, mate. Get out there, do some stuff. Don't, it's so easy to get stuck in just where you grew up, your hometown, doing your job, whether it's just like your one week holiday a year or whatever it may be, be adventurous and get out somewhere, experience different things because it changes your whole perspective on life and what's possible. How can I train my shoulders while traveling? Well, mate, you can train them exactly the same way you train them when you're not traveling. Uh, loads of questions in here about staying in shape and fitness while traveling, so I'll give you some specific advice. But essentially, 
there's gyms all over the world. Like, <laughs> it's not just your hometown and your country that has gyms. I've been to some unreal gyms. If you watch all of the vlogs, you'll, you'll see. So quite often you've got heavy barbells, you've got heavy dumbbells, and you can make it work with your original training split. If you don't have anything, I've got one video, uh, which is like body weight training with zero equipment that I filmed like a year ago in the Philippines, more than a year ago now. But the, the theory still stands. It's based on fundamental biomechanic principles and getting your muscles to failure with as little weight as possible, maximizing the stimulus available to you. So you can check that out. Here's the thumbnail and I'll put it in the description as well. Uh, but for training your shoulders, depends how strong you are, you can either do handstand push-ups, assisted by a wall or completely free. Uh, you can do pike push-ups where you're like tilting at the hips and the pelvis and then like putting more load on the shoulders rather than on the chest. Um, and you can do lateral raises with, you can find anything like heavy rocks and get your shoulders working like that as well. Loads of questions similar to this. Do, how do you travel without working or are you working? Um, I am working and it's so difficult. When I first started a year ago in Southeast Asia, I wasn't working, well I was, I was working on the social media, on the content, that was number one priority, but I didn't have any other humans that I was accountable for since I just left my, my previous job. Uh, same in Sub-Saharan Africa, like working on the social super hard and now this is the first time I've been managing socials uh, an employee technically and then also managing my clients as well so lots on the goal at the same time that's what provides the income as things stand and that's what allows me to continue to do the things that I grew up dreaming of doing and explore the places um, that some of you can't go to some of you want to go to and some of you have already been to um, and just living it up for myself next question is can we meet uh, maybe if you see me then we can meet say hello do you often hook up on your travels? Rumor has it you're a busy boy in Thailand. Well, I've not been to Thailand for five years, so I reckon there's just an extremely devilishly handsome doppelganger that was up to some funny ladyboy business, if that's what you're, you're insinuating. <laughs> um, but no, I haven't been to Thailand, so that wasn't me. The rumors uh, shouldn't stand. What's your favorite place that you visited? This is a very interesting question as well. It's actually a very boring question <laughs> and a very interesting question because it's so easy to want to rank everything we do in life and say, this is the best, this is second best, this is the worst, but that's not actually conducive or necessary for a happy and successful life. I've had so many fantastic, been to so many fantastic places, had so many fantastic experiences, and they're all different because they're with different people in different environments. And it doesn't mean that one is better than the other. Um, it just means they're different for their own beautiful sake. And so I could say the desert in Jordan is absolutely stunning, the Wadi Rum Desert, or the same in, the, in Namibia when I road tripped that for a week, barely seeing any other people, uh, or diving deep into the cenotes in Mexico, or trekking five days deep into the jungle in Guatemala, or on a rogue boat trip uh, off the coast of Panama. In all of these places, you meet loads of different people, have a vastly different experience and they're all absolutely beautiful so i'm not going to rank anything but i've given you a few that obviously first came to mind so that's a good indication uh, of what was kind of emotionally triggering for me next question is favorite watch and this was asked by g-shock man so i think he knows i'm wearing a g-shock uh, when i'm traveling i don't like getting mugged obviously or having any physical confrontations because it can always get messy so i wear a casio ga 2100 and the reason for that is it's indestructible. I can lob it at you if I wanted to. Um, it wouldn't break. And it's got a light, tells the time, and people generally don't want to nick it because it's not um, worth thousands of pounds or stainless steel. So that's why I travel in this. And then I've got a um, Amiga, what is it? The Moon Swatch for like dressing up super light, but so it doesn't. I don't have to carry it around. And it also you can fit it, wear it with a shirt rather than having. Uh, this because that doesn't go with a shirt um, but my favorite watch is probably the uh, JLC Reverso which you can see me talking about in my conversation with Oscar Strong from Official Watches fantastic chat similar to a Q&A style thing so I'll link that in the description as well uh, where I talk about my current collection and favorite watches how to be too handsome <laughs> uh, I'm gonna try and answer this question it's a bit of a, a rogue one how to be too handsome how to be more handsome I can answer and it's actually pretty simple like there's two ways that men are found more attractive. One of them is social status, and then one of them is physical appearance. They're kind of the two major things that make someone say, oh, this guy's attractive. Because uh, if you see, like there's plenty of Hollywood movie stars you'd see on the street as a, as a woman or a gay man and be like, 
this guy is not attractive, but just because he's got that social status and the financial security, he's more attractive. So I would say that that is one way to become more attractive as a man. Work on your ability to provide and have social security. And then the other way is to make yourself as physically attractive as possible. And one of those is being competent in like many different domains. So that could be learning how to fight. It could be building up your body. And in building up your body and building up your, obviously your muscle mass, like getting to a low body fat, doing heavy compound lifts, it like builds up your jaw, builds up your neck uh, and makes your face more physically attractive as well. So yeah, not being skinny and not being fat potentially even creatine as well. I don't know if this is, this is mainly due to the fact that I grew a lot when I started taking creatine, but also my face filled out and makes you look more, more masculine and handsome. So um, I didn't answer that question in the way that it was probably intended, but there's some good advice in there for you if you want it. I don't have a question, but I do appreciate your traveling and workout content, thank you. You're welcome and thank you for the message because I am human and sometimes I'll go like days or weeks without seeing like a message where so, like an individual says this actually is meaningful to me and helps me so always fire them over i love to see it and it keeps me motivated because like we talked about at the very start with how i stay motivated when less like if less people watch a video but when i can connect the number to an individual person be like damn like i'm actually having a substantial impact on that person's life that's the entire reason that i post all of this content so um yeah thank you for the message jet skis behind me you see them maybe i'll be on one of them in a future video who knows I've got a couple of mental health related questions which I will get to, I've had a scan through, but this one is, do you get also, do you get lonely while traveling? And the answer is yes. My first two trips were in Southeast Asia, Australasia, and then Sub-Saharan Africa. Then I came back for a bit and then I've headed over to America for a, a longer, more extended trip. And on the first two trips, I was completely solo. I met up with some old faces in various places, which obviously really helps. Then for America, I've had cameraman Mike with me, which has been like a game changer in terms of loneliness. But what I'm kind of doing here is beating around the bush in terms of saying that, yes, it was a major factor. Probably my most considerable negative emotion while traveling in Southeast Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa was the, the loneliness factor because you don't have that like familiar face. Uh, it's, it's hard to describe, but obviously as humans, we're very social animals. And so there's points where I'm not, when I'm on an adventure, I, I can climb a mountain for five days on my own and not care that I'm on my own. It's when you get back into a steady state, you're editing videos, you just want to go for a simple dinner and socialize. And then you have to work on making friends, like staying in a hostel, chatting to 10 people you don't want to talk to before you find one that you do. And so having someone you've already got an established relationship with stops the loneliness in those times. So yes, generally I do <laughs> struggle with loneliness, but like, it's not even something that I've considered over the last three months, which I'm super grateful for. Um, but there's pros and cons to everything. Like I grew all of the social media and the audience like while I was feeling particularly lonely on those first two trips. So there's always pros and cons and you've got to roll with the punches, appreciate the good things whenever there's bad things. And that goes for like any positive and negative in life. How old are you? I am 26 years old. 26 revolutions around the sun, my friend. Uh, and if you're wondering about the gray hair, some of you have been very mean in the comments and said I've got grey hair. I've had that since I was like 12 years old and it's on the sides. Maybe it will, maybe I'll be a silver fox in 10 years. Maybe it will take longer. But at the moment I'm like 14 years of grey hair and it's not crept onto the top yet. So we'll see. I don't care. So it's fine. <laughs> Everyone has different, I may as well comment on it while we're talking about it. Everyone has different physical appearances. Some of which are traditionally attractive or desirable or not desirable but the only thing that actually makes a difference in your mind on a daily basis is whether you care about it so i couldn't care less about whether i had fully gray hair or fully brown hair so that's an example of like if you're fully bald or not fully bald like no one else cares it's only about whether you care that's going to affect your mental state on a daily basis favorite place you've gone scuba diving scuba diving looking to do, do sorry i can't talk anymore you've used all my words favorite place you've gone scuba diving looking to plan a dive trip this year my favorite place was Sipadan Island in Malaysia so far. It was unbelievable. A dive, my favorite dive spot was called Barracuda Point on Sipadan Island. So it's like an X, I don't remember all the stats, but it's like thousand foot drop off and it's an X like volcanic island. So it's super hot and that causes it to be a hub for all of the local fish and sharks and whatnot. And there's an insane wall at Barracuda Point that just completely drops off and it disappears into the abyss. And uh, you can swim along the wall and see uh, gray reef sharks, white tip reef sharks and all sorts of fish and yeah like the huge swarms of barracuda and and jackfish uh, the full video is obviously out this is what the thumbnail looks like and this is in the description as well so you can check that out also I, the reason i came to the bahamas is to scuba dive uh, so i've done we've got a plane a seaplane above us pretty cool yeah the reason i took advantage of this bahamas trip is because it's an absolute hub for 
Caribbean reef shark diving, which is what I did yesterday. Uh, the video is not out yet. It was unreal, so much better than I thought it was going to be. Uh, just like seeing them like in their natural habitat on the sand and in the reef, and then also the second dive where we fed them up uh, nice and close. Not like disrupting their natural feeding patterns, but just giving them like a midnight snack. Uh, and they love interacting with humans. The way the nurse sharks interacted with humans as well was incredible. They love like being stroked like a dog under the under the neck. So yeah, that was awesome. So look into that as well, but this place is mega expensive. So Sipadam was a cheaper alternative. And I want to get to the Red Sea as well. You can do hammerheads in the Red Sea, obviously not appropriate at the moment given the Gaza conflict, but um, something to think about as well. Best advice for staying level-headed and how to avoid stress. Fantastic question. And I've got a fantastic answer for you you've caused yourself a little bit of a paradox my friend so the advice for staying level-headed isn't to avoid stress being in stressful st situations and having stressful stimulus and overcoming them is what causes you to be level-headed because of the sheer number of situations environments people encounters i've had i'm well equipped and competent to deal with a wide range of emotions so if i'm late for a flight can't eat for a couple of days like feeling sick in a group of people that I don't want to be with or in a like physical situation where it looks like there's going to be some trouble and I have to make my way out of it. Anything like that, because I've experienced so many situations, I can stay level-headed when things get bleak and also when things aren't so bleak, like it's not an interesting stimulus for me, which has pros and cons because I can get bored like with things that aren't extreme. But the way to stay level-headed is to keep exposing yourself to like difficult stimulus, things that would cause you to get stressed. And then when you realize that you can overcome them, it helps you stay level-headed in those situations. Uh, the other one, the other way is the classic stoic principle of removing your action from the initial impulse. So say someone says something that offends you, don't consider it offending you, consider them saying something and now you've got the opportunity to respond to that however you want to. So you don't have to react to it in an emotional fashion. You can like stoically think about what the best and most appropriate response is, both for their well-being and for yours, so that you can move on and have an optimal outcome given whatever that initial stimulus is. Another example is if I'm with someone that's like always moaning or like really miserable in a certain situation, I'm obviously just not gonna stick around them. People will like moan back or bitch about them behind their back and say, this guy's horrible, like why? Like it's a shame that we have to hang out with him and stuff, but you don't have to hang out with them. You can do whatever you want. So like look at the situation. If there's someone that's not enjoyable to be around, just don't be around them. And you don't have to react emotionally to everything that comes your way. Continuing the answer as well while I think about it, uh, skydiving, scuba diving, they're all relatively stressful situations. Like scuba diving, when you're descending, having to equalize uh, in a brand new environment, there's a current, like there's a lot to think about all at once. It's extremely stressful. You've got to learn how to stay calm in that situation. Breathe slowly, not panic. And that's the only way you're going to be successful. Same with skydiving. You're dealing with an absolute sensational overload of traveling through the air at 120 miles an hour, getting whipped around. And you've got to know how to stay calm in that situation overcome it and so doing those types of things lend themselves to everyday life so that you don't get triggered uh, by something that others may might get triggered by how do you choose your next destination what do you consider cost security etc um, obviously those things are all a factor for me now it's like is it too expensive to go to if no then look into it is does it look exciting like something I've not done before like something that other people haven't done before then obviously that makes it more attractive as well Security is a factor, but generally anywhere in the world, like you can find pockets, safe pockets, whether it's like in a nice hotel in a horrible area, or you're just like staying in busier places in the daytime, covering up if you're white in like an environment where like you look like a walking dollar sign, things like that. There's obviously things that you can do and master the more you travel. For me, it's exactly what I just said, finding cool stuff that either I haven't done anything similar to before, other people haven't done, um, or it's an opportunity to push myself further than I've been before. And then cost is obviously a factor. Safety is obviously a factor, but you've got to optimize for one thing and then see where the other levels are uh, to see if it's worthwhile or not. Very vague answer and very political answer. Sorry about that, but it's variable for everyone. And I kind of told you where I'm at. Motivation to stay the gym or stick into a particular routine in general. Great question. And it's one that's like very polarizing because you either have this ability or you don't. And it always comes down to why, why you want to do something, why you want to stay in the gym. I don't have, I don't need motivation to stay in the gym because I have made like a decision matrix that dictates that I need to stay in the gym. For example, do I want to be the best version of myself? Yes. Do I want to be in top physical health all the time? Yes. Do I need to go to the gym in order to sustain those two things physically? Yes. I'm testing myself mentally consistently and physically consistently. I want to look great. I want to feel great. And going to the gym 
is necessary to achieve that. So when I'm at home and I'm like, right, I really don't want to go to the gym, I remind myself, like, why do we go to the gym? Oh, it's because we want, well, I don't even anymore remind myself because it's second nature, but obviously in that, I've been training for 10 years. So in that transition period of like struggling for motivation, you realize that, that you just have to look at the input and look at the output and extrapolate from one point to the other. And so I know like, right, I can sit on the sofa, not go to the gym, but how does that make me look in five years time if I continue to have that type of behavior? Is that the best version of myself that breaks promises to myself and doesn't do what I say I'm gonna do? That's not in top physical condition? No, therefore I must go to the gym. Um, motivation's fleeting. And sticking to a particular routine in general, it's very much the same answer. I don't do a routine because it's the most fun or enjoyable. I do it because it's optimal for whatever I'm optimizing for. So I do heavy, barbell back squats, not because I like heavy barbell back squatting. Don't get me wrong, I love the feeling when I overcome it and beat a heavy barbell back squat, but it's fantastic for overall central nervous system stress, banging the quads and the glutes, like keeping them big, strong, knee health, like spine health, everything, keeping it in check. And so that's why I back squat. So even if I'm not motivated to back squat for 10 years in a row, <laughs> I know why I need to do it. And that allows me to keep doing it. Ha ha ha. <laughs> Come to Antigua, mate. I have been to Antigua in Guatemala, which is fantastic. Well, Antigua or Antigua, I'm not sure which one you mean. Antigua in Guatemala, fantastic, love it. Little town in the south of Guatemala, next to Guatemala City. I I'm sure I'll be back at some point in my life. I've been, and there's videos there, so you can find them on my channel. Or if you mean Antigua, I think that's how you say the Caribbean island. Um, I haven't been, and I would love to go. I'm in love. I've always wanted to go to the Caribbean. When I was a kid, it was always... Uh, like a magical place for me to be here in the Bahamas talking to you right now is honestly mind-blowing uh, and there's so many other places like cheaper places places that are easier to find culture I'm on Paradise Island right now full of tourists which is not exactly the most culturally immersive experience and so there's plenty of other Caribbean islands that I will be going to I'm sure what's the best experience you had traveling good question I kind of answered that in the best place uh, I've been to traveling and there isn't one um, best experiences are always the ones where you're in a flow state and there's just a point where you're like, fuck, my life is sick. I can't believe that I'm actually doing this right now after like one year ago, two years ago, three years ago, that's what I was doing. And now I'm here paddling out in off a Indonesian island on Lombok about to catch a sick wave after just catching a sick wave. And like, this is what I'm doing on a Tuesday afternoon at 2 p.m. Like, that is an unbelievable feeling. And then I have those kind of like, just moments of this is sick at various points. So one of them was like, the, like 20, 15 meters deep in the pit cenote in Mexico, where that beam of light was just coming in. I was on a private tour as the only one in the cenote, me and my guide, criminally underwatched video. I put the thumbnail here and I'll put the link in the description as well. I urge you to go and watch that one. You'll love it. It's like nothing you've seen on planet earth. Both of those two cenote dives. And I just had a moment where I was like, this is so sick, you know? Um, the last day on the jungle trek in Guatemala, I was just euphoric. I was with a group of people I really resonated with. We had fantastic egoless chats, storming through the jungle after five days of trekking. Um, obviously the psychological euphoria of the endurance event played a part, but equally it still, it still counts, you know? I felt fantastic and I just had that overwhelming feeling of, of gratitude for where I am now and what I'm doing. Favorite place in Latin America so far? So all I've done in Latin America is from the Yucatan Peninsula down through Central America, skipped a few countries and then down into Colombia. And my favorite place in Latin America would be Guatemala. Had some mad adventures there, both on Lake Atitlan, climbing Volcan Tajmulco on my own, complete solo mission on a motorbike. Uh, also loved Antigua, the town. I like Flores and that jungle trek. Guatemala is an absolute gem. It's getting more touristy, uh, but if you're looking for an, an easy introduction into Central America and Latin America, that's a fantastic place. Um, also, a video that's also not out yet is uh, Lake Guatape. I did some incredible adventures on Lake Guatape. I'm not actually gonna tell you what they were. You'll see very, very soon. Um, it's right next to Medellin in Colombia. So we had a great time there as well. Also, might just be out around this video is the San Blas Adventures from Panama City. We took a boat, a four day boat trip across the most beautiful islands in the world over to Colombia and then landed semi illegally in Colombia and then got a passport stamped. Um, and those islands are just stunning. Backpacking budget, what accommodations you stay in? Mm, well, mate, I stay in hostel world accommodations generally. Like when I started, when I was on more of a budget, um, you can go on hostel world, see what the dorm rates are, see what the private rates are, see what's highly rated and just adjust based on your budget. So find a cheap room in a dorm, 
like the more beds there are in a dorm the more cheap it's going to be that's not good english probably the cheaper it's going to be so yeah look on hostel world and then a little tip is hostel world gets you to pay like a 15 percent deposit and then you pay the rest to the accommodation typically it depends how busy it is but booking direct with an accommodation on their website or once you get there and you need to extend, extending directly on their website will save you money. Um, but it, also you can find Airbnb super cheap in some places as well. Like in the Philippines, I had a 15 pound a night Airbnb for a week. Um, and then booking.com and Agoda, you can find cheap hotel rooms if you need to get away uh, for a bit as well. Where do you want to see yourself in the next five years? Good question. Like obviously it's a fantastic question because you get an insight into my mindset about what my trajectory is, how I'm planning to get there, uh, and what the next steps are but I don't talk about future goals at this point at this moment in time because I don't think it's important or a good idea uh, to discuss what you're planning in the future mainly because you get like a dopamine release of saying what you're going to do and getting super excited about it and then you end up not doing it so I think you should plan and act in silence and work hard in silence and then achieve whatever output metrics come as a result of that and so for me I know where I want to be and what I want to be doing and like the state I want my life to be in in five years time I know what input metrics are necessary in order to get there. And so I just continue doing the work every single day um, and iterate and optimize along that path. Boring, scientific, mechanical engineering type answer, but that is my answer. So I hope that helps. What is the most life altering revelation you've had in the last year? Very deep question, probably the deepest one I'll answer. So stop the video after this, you don't need to watch anymore. <laughs> it was probably around just under a year ago and it was i always talk about bodybuilding being a microcosm for everything you want to achieve in life so you start in a certain position you don't see changes on a daily basis and then all of a sudden the work the hard work and the results compound and then all of a sudden you're in a completely different position to where you started and you're unrecognizable to your previous self and even though on those days where you're not motivated you don't feel like doing it you don't feel like you're getting anywhere you can look back at the whole picture and be like damn i actually can achieve whatever i want to if i do the work stay on the right path and be patient. And so I knew that after I achieved the body that I wanted from my skinny, unconfident starting position, I knew that I could extrapolate that to other areas of my life and achieve what I wanted to, but I didn't have any concrete evidence that that was possible. So after I achieved the body that I wanted, I had a relatively successful career in operations management and like my future mapped out for me. And I knew if I continued to put in the work, I could continue on the same path and have a like fantastic career but it just wasn't suited to my psyche and what I wanted to achieve. And so then I went on this, on this path and starting the social media, not getting any traction, just input metric, input metric, doing your best, doing your best, doing your best, not worrying about the output. All of a sudden, success. Because you've done the work, you're not worried about the output, you're continuing to optimize and just doing your best, then you find the success. And so that was obviously in the last year where I had like a, a major breakthrough uh, and the audience grew quite a lot. And so now I have like two, three very considerable data points that I can do anything that I want to as long as I put the work in and put my mind to it. Um, that actually sounds pretty cliche when you say it like that, but it's all about how you internalize things and I know that's true and that's pretty life altering. So now I'm just full steam ahead on my goals. Do you have a video on how to be a good tourist? I think some things are intuitive, but not all. I think that's a fantastic question and it's not something I've ever considered before. By be a good tourist, I don't think you mean be a successful tourist or like how to be good at tourism. You mean how to be a respectful tourist. That's how I've interpreted the question. And some people get it right, some people get it wrong. The culture of where you're going changes dramatically depending on where you are. And so that's probably the main thing that dictates whether you're gonna be a good tourist or a bad tourist, is your ability to morph into that culture, understand the way it works and be respectful to it. So obviously, if I'm in Dubai, I'm not gonna be walking around with my top off in the middle of the mall, otherwise I don't even know the the law probably sent to, sent to jail uh, or like PDA public displays of affection in Dubai obviously you know that's a no-no so you don't do it and equally like somewhere like the Bahamas this was a huge culture culture shock to me uh, it's very it's got an extremely British heritage because we ran the country until 50 years ago this year is when they got their independence and then equally all the rich Americans come over here as a holiday destination so the Bahamian dollar is tied one-to-one -one with the US dollar um, but everyone here speaks English obviously because we founded America and founded uh, the Bahamas. However, there's a huge cultural difference in terms of US humor and British humor and then Bahamian humor as well. There was a story yesterday, I was on the boat shark diving and w when you're diving, you use baby shampoo to like rub into the mask to stop it fogging up. So the guy at the end of his speech is like, any questions? And I'm like, yeah, do you have any baby shampoo? Like, cause sometimes people don't use it. You just spit in the mask, sometimes they do. He knew exactly why I was asking for baby shampoo. Yet he said, 
yeah, why, uh, or he just said, why do you want baby shampoo? And I was like, for the mask, like to stop it from fogging. And he said, look, what's that behind you? So I turn around and I'm like, yeah, baby shampoo. And he's like, there you go. And if you did that in England, like you're an absolute prick. That's completely rude and unreasonable thing to be like, to a paying customer as well. Like, what's that behind you? Like, shut up, you knob. <laughs> but I don't know, I'm in a new culture. I'm in their country. So I'm not gonna start kicking up a fuss about like the way that he's speaking to me or whatever, because I'm the tourist here. I'm like technically an immigrant for all intents and purposes. So it's my responsibility to learn the culture and like learn the humor. Maybe that's the way that they joke or maybe he was just a prick. I don't know, but I found that some abrasive personalities in the Bahamas in general. So yeah, potentially that's, that's that. The same with if I'm in a supermarket or walking around in a street and all the locals are walking really slowly and I'm in a hurry trying to get somewhere, like I'm not gonna, and people are like in the way, I'm the tourist, I'm the immigrant. I'm not gonna like budge out of the way and be like, why are you walking so slowly? Like that's rude and disrespectful. I'm in their country. I have to operate in a way accordingly. So yeah, I'll potentially make a video on being a good tourist, but they're kind of two things that, that stand out. Just remember your, your place and the fact that you're a visitor and you have to adhere to um, whatever is appropriate in that place. What is your most cancel worthy hot take? <laughs> yeah, nice try mate, you wish. I'm not gonna get canceled that easily. Uh, if I, maybe if I'm on a podcast and I get put into a corner and ask some difficult questions, you'll, you'll get one out of me, but <laughs> I'm not committing suicide, thank you. Um, I am getting burnt though, maybe, or I'm getting a lot of sun. It is exactly midday. Well done, Adam, very wise time to, uh, to do a Q and A. And the next question is, do you wear sun cream? So what I'm gonna do is answer that question and then reapply to my face. <laughs> uh, yes, I do wear sun cream. Sometimes, this is, a, I don't know if this is interesting. Sometimes I forget, obviously, like everyone else. So when I got that stupidly high fade in Costa Rica, which was one of the last videos, I got burnt on the back of my head because I've never had to put sun cream on the back of my head before and that got me. When I was sn snorkeling in Belize, the water was nice and fresh and cold, so I didn't put any sun cream on the middle of my back and that went to a crisp, so that was a very bad idea. But yeah, in general, factor 50. Lo uh, what's the white road? Like load it up, lather it up, lay it on thick and uh, stay protected because you can tan through it and there's just no point getting burnt. It's just not good for you. It's just not a good idea, mate. Right, I'm putting more sun cream on now. Let's go. How's the cream? Rubbed in? Don't care. <laughs> no rush, but could you make a couple YouTube playlists based on the difficulty of your adventure? Yes. When I edit this video and look at it back and this question comes up and I watch myself saying yes, I will go on the laptop, do some tinkering and make one, not in hierarchy, just be like my most intense adventures and uh, make a playlist for that. Is there anything in the US that you want to see someday? Yes, lots of stuff. It's a huge country, loads of states, loads of culture in each state. There I do, but um, there's other priorities first, but for sure, for sure there's lots on the list. Is whey isolate better than ordinary whey powder? It depends entirely on your goals. If you want, the, essentially the difference is whey isolate is just no lactose and no fat and no carbs basically. Whereas whey powder has slightly more carbs, slightly more fat and it has lactose in it. So if you struggle to digest lactose, then you want whey isolate. If you're trying to lose weight while well, maximizing protein, minimizing carbs and fat uh, or minimizing carbs and fat from your whey, then obviously you would go for isolate in that scenario as well. If you're bulking and you have no problems with lactose then or just like at maintenance, then whey powder is absolutely fine. So I generally like have absolutely no need for isolate. So we just use whey, normal whey. Powder. Do you travel alone? Answered that. Uh, first two trips, yes, solo, met some people. Last trip with Mike, but I might be solo again. I will be solo again at various points. So uh, generally, yeah. But it's very difficult to make like high quality content as a team of one. So I will be scaling a fair bit over the next year, two years probably, if we continue along the same path. So uh, that'll be like alone for adventures, but team around me, more of a team around me. How often do you work on abs? Not often enough, probably, because I, I do entirely compound lifts, as you know, if you watch any of my videos, like very functional training, entirely compound, and so your core is always braced when you're doing those things. But I do love, I don't love ab, ab exercises, I hate ab exercises and I neglect them quite a lot, but uh, it's obviously important for a well-rounded physique and a strong core. So I do hanging leg raises a fair bit, Russian twists a little bit, and uh, what else do I do? Cable crunches sometimes, V-ups, that kind of thing. How often? Once a week, let's say. Any travel romances? None of your damn business, my friend. More tips for a solo traveler. I'm not answering that. Oh, that's a bit rude of me, actually. I will answer that, but that's not a very specific question, and I can't think of tips on the go. I'll give you one tip now. Um, do 
book in a good hostel, the best hostel, hostel that your budget allows so that you can meet the most people. And those people are generally the ones that are gonna be keen to do activities. So you'll make a friend in the common area, then book onto a tour straight away, uh, regardless of whether you've made a friend or not, whatever, the, whatever is to do in the area, book onto a tour. You'll, they'll be forced to speak with you, even if you're boring and annoying. So you'll be in a group of whatever, like four people, 10 people, 20 people, do whatever the thing to do in that area is, you'll make some friends, and then all of a sudden you're going for dinner with people, you're hanging out with people, you find some people that could be lifelong friends. Yeah, and just find a good balance, work out how extroverted and how introverted you are, and then optimize your traveling for like being in that environment. So most people that I've met, and myself included, like to be with people for most of the week, and then just have enough alone time to stay charged. Some people want to be with people constantly, so find other people that are aligned with that and travel at a speed that is aligned with that. Keep things open-ended as well, relatively, so that if you find people that you like, you can join their plans or meander around, do things that were initially unplanned. Generally, like plan a week in advance or plan flights like a month in advance maximum. Make them cancelable if you think you want to meet people and make your plans change a little bit.